Thank you for coming in today and thank you for applying for the job. So just gonna have a quick read through your resume just to make sure that you're the right person that we're looking for for the babysitting position here. Whatever. So, what made you apply for the job? Um, I was born in a garden, so I'd be like a fantastic gardener. This, th this is the, for the babysitting position. Uh, that's what I said. Right. Well, it says here that you are a parent. That's fantastic. So, uh, how many kids have you had? All of them. Uh, well, let's just talk about your first. I'd rather not. Uh, what about your family? Uh, my husband's great. He treats me like the first lady that I am, and I know that he cares so much about me, and that he would he would he would give his his left rib for me. Wow. I, <laughs> That's a very dedicated husband. So, but uh, more about you. Um. So, uh, say, what were you doing in? Uh, are you, are you texting? Yeah, so? Put the phone down and let's finish the interview. Oh my god, whatever, I'm texting this absolute snake of a guy right now. I wish he'd just get off my case. Is what I'm saying not important enough? Oh my god, don't tell me what to do. My Apple iPhone is the most important thing in my life right now. Gosh, just, gosh, you don't even get me. Next! Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our one and only lead pastor, Daniel Indrajaya! That is the worst 15 seconds of my life. They made me do that. Don't make me do that again. Good morning, everybody. It's so good to have you in church this morning, especially if this is your first time coming to the rocks. We don't do this every Sunday, all right? Just to let you know. Um, I'm not that stupid. I don't embarrass myself that way. But thank you for being here. You are definitely our VIP guest if this is your first time coming to our church. Our slogan around here is no perfect people allowed. There's nobody who calls this church home is perfect. And that's why no matter who you are, where you are in your spiritual journey, maybe you're not even a Christian. It doesn't matter. You are at the right place here this morning. You are welcome to join in this faith community as we journey together and discover that we have a God who is gracious toward us, and we have a God who is very forgiving toward us as well, and I hope you will discover that along together with us. We want to welcome also our YouTube viewers and podcast listeners. Thanks for joining in. Today, as John has mentioned, we are starting a brand new message series, so you come at the right time this morning, that we are calling Bad Girls of the Bible. I want to start off by saying that none of us made it our life ambition to be bad, right? We sort of just slide into it. We stumble into rebellious youth. We wandered into a habit that is addictive and destructive in our lives. And we mix with the wrong crowd. So after some time, we sort of become this bad person, if you like. And for some of you, for some of us, we even wear this badness badge with, with pride, we like, we like it when people call us a bad boy or, or a bad girl. And for some of us, we don't even know if we can stop being bad. Maybe some of you think that you've gone too far, that this is just the life that you are meant to live, like you are beyond redemption. Well, this morning, I want to start by telling you the good news that there's no sin that you can commit. There's no badness that you can do that will make you beyond God's love and beyond God's forgiveness and beyond God's redemption. See, none of us here is perfect. So, you know, when we talk about badness, like we, we always think of the usual suspects. You know, this is our definition of bad. Killing, stealing, cheating, lying, adultery, lust, cruelty, idolatry, robbing a bank, you know. We think of this wonderful stuff as what it means to be bad. But, you know, being bad doesn't have to be that dramatic. Do you know that? How about laziness? We don't talk about that much. How about anger? 
How about selfishness? How about unkind word, gossip, unrepentant attitude, uh, impure thought, and so on? See, by this definition, and this is the definition of what is bad, what is sin in our lives. And when Jesus came along, he made it even tougher. You know, if you think you're good, Jesus said, when you look at a woman who is not your wife with lust, you already committed adultery with her. When you are angry with your brother, you are, you are killing him. See, this is God's standard of badness. And in that sense, actually, all of us have been bad. And that's why we're so excited to bring you this message series called Bad Girls of the Bible, because I don't know about you, but for me, I find it difficult to identify with people who got it all together. I find it difficult to learn from someone who seems, uh, who seems to have everything worked out in their lives, you see? I, I can't identify with them. I find myself spending a lot of energy comparing with them, falling short, you know, and it doesn't help me to grow closer to God. And maybe some of you here, ladies especially, today is Mother's Day, maybe some of you ladies here feel like me. You know, you try to be good, but you try to read your Bible, but you can't identify with the good women of the Bible. You know, you read about Ruth. Man, my goodness, Ruth, and she, she was so faithful. She was so committed to her mother-in-law. And you said to yourself, there's no way I'm going to be that committed to my mother-in-law. You know, you're struggling with, with that. You know, you can't identify with Ruth. And then we talk about when you, you open your Bible, you read about Esther, how courageous she was. And you said to yourself, there's no way, again, in the world, I can be as courageous as Esther. I can't identify with Esther. And then you read about Mary, how innocent she was. And then you remember all the past mistakes that you've made. Maybe you think even God would loathe you because of those mistakes. You are nowhere near as innocent as Mary. And you can't identify with Mary, with none of this, with any of these biblical women, biblical characters. And then you read about Jezebel, and you said to yourself, this is the woman I can identify with, with her sudden burst of anger, with her desire for control, you know, like, this is the woman I can identify with. I can identify with Jezebel. I want to be like her, until you read about her really tragic demise at the end. And, oh, I don't want to be like Jezebel. But, you see, many of us, if you want to be honest, we can identify more with people who struggle the same way we do. And that's the reason why I believe God, you know, in His divine wisdom, leaves this story in the Bible for us to read because there's a lesson to be learned from their life experience. And today we're going to start with the first bad woman of the Bible, the mother of all mothers, and we're going to talk about Eve today as we start off our series. And you know, there's so many things that we can learn from Eve life story. But today, I just want to focus on one, and that is, uh, I want to make Eve a case study on temptation. A case study on temptation, all right? Uh, a few years ago, I read a, a really tragic story about a man who was sentenced to 20 years in prison in Texas. He was a Christian, but when I read the story, what disturbed me was the fact that he was a fellow, you know, student at Dallas Theological Seminary, a place where I studied for four years, you know. When he left seminary, he left with a lot of gifts, with passion, and he pastored two highly successful churches uh, at different times. And, and on, on just one, you know, really, really bad time of ten temptation, he fell all the way into the abyss and he destroyed everything that he had built, the ministry that he had built, and just put a lot of smear into the message of the gospel. And then I read that story, and I thought to myself, man, that is tragic. But then I asked a bigger question. What happened? What could cause a man to mortgage all of his life for just a momentary moment of pleasure or whatever it is that he was thinking at the time? And then... I came to this conclusion that uh, we always have to be on our guard when it comes to 
temptation. And that's why Eve is a perfect person to be a case study on temptation. You know why? Because Eve, you know, when you want to do a case study, you have to remove all the, 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 the variables, right? For us, we're not a good case study on temptation. You know why? Because we have baggages, right? We have hang-ups. We have hurts. Uh, some of us have, uh, we come from alcoholic uh, family. See, we, we grew up in an environment that is less than ideal, so we're not really a good case study. But Eve, she had no sinful heritage, right? She, has, she had no sinful surrounding. So Eve is a perfect person for a case study on temptation. And let me tell you, even though the story of Eve happened thousands and thousands of years ago, but it is as current as the temptation you may be facing this morning the temptation you faced last night, the temptation you faced in the office, at the workplace, at school, you know, even though the scenery may be changed. But guess what? The method remains the same. So this morning, we're going to study how does Satan tempt us into sin? If you bring your Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to start reading from uh, verse 1. Here's what it says. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? See, the serpent was very crafty. There's a lot of things we don't know, uh, that we don't know about in this story. For example, uh, there's a lot of things that we know as well. We know that the serpent is actually the devil. The book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 9, tells us that, right? But there are a lot of things that we don't know. Like, how did the serpent get there? How did the serpent enter paradise? Think about it. And what form did he take? Uh, did he take on the form of a snake? And how did he talk, right? How did he talk? What does that mean? Does that mean all the animals prior to the fall, they all talk? Because Eve didn't seem to be surprised that the serpent was talking. So Eve has no idea what is about to happen has no idea, has no clue, and, and she has every reason to not have any idea because after all, she is literally in paradise, right? And it's not like she, she woke up that morning and she, she said to herself, I, I need to spend quiet time with God because today is the day where the serpent is going to come and tempt me and all hell's going to break loose. There's going to be misery, sadness, tragedy, all the way for thousands of years, years, affecting billions and billions of people as I will fall and commit this first sin if I'm not careful. No, it didn't happen that way. See? See, this is what, uh, what I thought, all right? The serpent was in paradise. Temptation comes our way when we least expect it. When things go so well with you, you think you are free from temptation. You think that you have it good. No. Sometimes it is when everything goes well in your life that you are the most vulnerable, where you are the most tempted. So the question is, how does Satan tempt us into sin? I think there are different stages. Uh, see, this is what happened. Stage one, this is what I believe. Satan comes always in disguise. Genesis says, he is more crafty than any other wild animals that the Lord God had made. So he's very crafty. He always comes in disguise. How, does, how did he disguise himself? Well, he's disguised in his person, right? As Eve, I imagine, was walking along the cool of the garden that morning, you know, and he met with the serpent. He wasn't surprised. She wasn't surprised. She wasn't taken aback because the serpent was beautiful, right? Was very attractive creature, and when he speaks, like the voice carries a certain charisma and charm and command. So Eve was not taken by surprise at all. Like, in fact, Eve was like very relaxed, I, I believe, around the serpent. See, when Satan comes to you, he always comes to you in disguise. He disguises his person. He slides into your life like a comfortable companion. You know, you don't even know that he's there. You better be careful. The Bible says he doesn't come dressed up as an angel of light. Oh, well, he, well, he does come dressed up as, as an angel of light. See, he doesn't come as a roaring lion. He doesn't wave around his red flag warning you, hey, better be warned. No. 
See, he just slides into your life. You don't even know that he's there. He is disguised in his person, and he's also disguised in his purpose, right? Like, he didn't come to Eve and said, hey, I'm here to tempt you. No. Satan, in the form of a serpent, came to have a religious conversation. This is just a theological talk, you know. I just want to have a conversation with you. I want to know what's going on. Uh, I want to know what God really said, you know. I want to make sure that your exegesis is correct, see. That's what Satan does. He, he, he comes disguised in his purpose, you know. It's always novel. It's, al- it's always good. You know, one of the most difficult things to distinguish in your life is between the voice of God and the voice of Satan. Let me say it again. You think Satan, you know, will be obvious. No, he's not that stupid. He's not that stupid. It's going to be tough for you to distinguish the voice of God and the voice of Satan. The Bible already says so. He comes as a minister of the gospel. Can you imagine that, right? Can you imagine that? So, Satan will not knock on your door and say, excuse me, sir, excuse me, ma'am, if you would give me half an hour of your time, I'm here to damn you and I'm here to destroy you. No, he's not going to say that, right? Hey, I'm here for you. I'm on your side. I'm just going to have a religious conversation here. So he comes in this guy. He's very clever. And then, you know, when, that's the first stage. And then he engage you in a conversation. That's what he does next. At this point, you know, if you can talk to Eve, you say, Eve, don't do it, don't do it, don't fall into his trap. But no, unfortunately, Eve didn't realize what happened. So in verse 2 and 3, we read, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. What's is mistake here. Or the first mistake is that she engaged in the conversation. You shouldn't have done that in the first place. That's not what Joseph did. And for those of you who are familiar with the story of Joseph, he was tempted by his master's wife, the wife of Potiphar. You know, he didn't engage in the conversation. He didn't say to Potiphar's, Potiphar's wife, let's pray about this first and see how we go. No, <laughs> he just fled, right? He ran away. So, but when you look at the response from Eve, you think, Man, that's a good response. See, she seemed to know God's word really well, and she's like, you know, trying to do the right thing here. But guess what? No. Actually, there's a lot of things wrong with Eve's response here, right? I want to see if you can play the role of a Bible detective and find out the difference between what God really said and how Eve responded to the serpent. This is what God actually said in Genesis 2, 16 to 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, he spoke to Adam, the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. What's the difference between the left and the right? Yeah, there are a few things that are are different, right? Some of you are noticing a few things that are different. Let me help you along because of time. Here, on the left, God said, you are free to eat, freely eat, other translation says, yeah? That means God is so kind, He's so good to you, He's so good to Eve and Adam, He's he's providing them with abundance. You are free to eat, not from one tree, not from two or three, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, whatever you want, durian, mangoes, what else? Jackfruit, right? All the, all the fruits in the world. You are free to eat from any tree. You see, Eve conveniently drop out the word free and any. You know what Satan does really, really well? He's really good at changing your focus from God and His love and His provision to the one thing that you cannot have. How many people have fallen into this trap? God has blessed them so much with a lot of things in their life. You can't even count the blessings that God has put in your life. Some of the blessings you don't even realize. Some of the protection you didn't even realize, right? But there's this one thing that you want, and you 
you know, you zero in on that. You are so focused on that. God, and we went through it. I was one of the victims here. You know, for 10 years, we tried to have a baby, and we couldn't. And we blame God for it. God, what are you doing? You must not love me very much. You must not care about me very much because I've been praying for a baby, and you don't give me. You see, it's very easy for us to focus our attention on what God has provided, His character, you know, who He is, His provision, and then just focus on that one thing, you know. God, I really want a new wife, you know. I can't have this new wife to, oh. How about the, the next difference? What is that? Um, Eve added to God's word that was not really there. She said, and you must not touch it. You see, that's what we do. Sometimes we try to protect God, and then we try to put more and more restrictions into something that God never said, and it makes God, you know, to, he looks like the bad guy. Like, you know, to be a Christian means like, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Like, well, basically, you can't have any fun if you're a Christian. But God never, there's only one command. Can you imagine? God did not give 10, 100, 1,000 commandments in the, in the Garden of Eden. There was only one one command. The rest, they can do whatever they want, basically. And yet, we are so good at adding into God's restriction. And as a result, we felt like God is not for us. We felt, you know, uh, like we are being choked out of a good life. And that's not what happened. And then finally, uh, the last difference is, God said, because when you eat from this, you will certainly die. So Eve first undermines or underestimates God's provision for her and her husband, right? And she added to the Word of God that was not there. And then finally, she undermines the severity. She undermines the effect of disobedience and sin in their lives. You see, Eve conveniently dropped the word certainly. Maybe I'll die. Maybe I will not die. Who knows? But that's not what God said. God said, when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And they certainly died that day because death is not cessation of existence. Death is actually separation. From that moment on, they are separated spiritually from God. And, you know, they will die physically as well eventually. But that's what happened. When you engage in a conversation with the tempter, let me tell you, it's going to be very difficult for you to win. And then Satan launched into the next stage in tempting us. And that is, Satan always attacks God's word. He always attacks God's word. This is what he said in verse 4. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. Are you serious? If you're kidding me, right? Tell me, tell me you don't believe this. You are more sophisticated than this. How can you die from eating a piece of fruit? It doesn't make sense. Are you serious? You're joking. I know you don't believe this. See, Satan attacks the integrity of God's Word. And that's what he does all the time. You sure you believe what God says in His Word? You sure? You're an educated person. You're a sophisticated person. When God says He's going to be faithful to you in your life, you sure you believe that? After all what you've been through, you still believe that? Tell me you don't believe that. See, he attacks the Word of God. Not only that, Immediately after, he attacks not only God's word, but he also attacks the character of God. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You will know good and evil. You know what God is doing here? He's not for you. He wants to put you on a leash. He doesn't want you to have fun. He wants to control you all the time. He doesn't want you to be independent of Him and have fun. See, God is withholding something good from you because that's just His character. He's not as good as you think. He's not for you. He's against you. Come on, Eve. Open your eyes. You're going to be smarter here. He attacks God's Word first, and then He attacks God's character. And after that, guess what? That's it. There's nothing else need to be said. Actually, literally, after verse 5, the serpent stopped saying anything. 
because by that time, the damage has already been done, right? And that's stage five. Once your mind is poisoned, your behavior will follow, you see? The battle for us, Christians or non-Christians, is up here. It's in the mind. Once your mind is poisoned, your behavior will follow. One of the most beautiful sayings in the Bible, one of the most beautiful expression of faith and love and commitment is the statement uttered by Ruth. When she was with Naomi, her mother-in-law, her husband had passed away, right? She was a Moabite. Ruth was a Jew. And, you know, she had every right to leave her and not come back to her hometown. Um, in fact, her sister-in-law had already left Naomi. Uh, and Naomi said, you go too. Don't just leave me alone. You know, you have a, a long life to live. You know, you go free, marry somebody else. And yet, Ruth, a stranger, not a Jew, she made this most beautiful statement of love and commitment like, like, like no other. It's recorded for us in the scripture. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, this is what Ruth said to her mother-in-law. Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Not going to do that. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. What a beautiful, beautiful statement of faith, love, and commitment. But imagine with me. Imagine the day before this happened. Someone came to Naomi and said, you know that no good daughter-in-law of yours, Ruth? You know, she was just out for herself. You know, she's going to say things that may sound good to you, but guess what? She's just looking after herself. I know what she wanted to do. She wanted to marry some rich Jewish guy so that she would be well taken care of. So be careful with that woman. Imagine what would happen to Naomi the next day when Ruth said this. Her mind had been poisoned, right? What, 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 what would be a beautiful statement of faith, love, and commitment suddenly became like a very cunning statement, a very selfish statement. See what happened? Once you allow your mind to be poisoned, your behavior will follow. In verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit uh, of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. This is all the three temptations of life. I don't have time to explain this uh, further. In the New Testament, loss of the flesh, loss of the eyes, and pride of life, these three is the same thing. When, when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the, in the desert, it's the same thing, right? Loss of the flesh, loss of the eyes, and pride of life. When she saw all this, things, she took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, who was, by the way, before you start blaming Eve for all the trouble that we are in right now, the husband was with her all along. He was supposed to be the leader. He was supposed to warn Eve. I mean, the first, God's word first came to him. And yet, throughout this whole time, Adam didn't say anything. He was silenced, strangely. And that's why this was as much Adam's fault as it was Eve. And that's how Satan tempts us into sin. You know, imagine with me, if that morning the serpent had come to Eve and said, Hey Eve, look at this paper. Would you sign here to declare that from now on you will not have nothing to do with God? Do you think Eve will sign it? No way, right? But he was so sly, <laughs> he, came, like he, he was a smooth criminal. He was. And that's what happened. So I want to leave you with some practical tips before we go. Number one, be on your guard against Satan's deception. He is the father of lies. What may sound good to you, what may make sense to you, may not necessarily come from God. All right? Be on your guard, especially when things go well with you. Don't, you know, don't just pull down your guard. Make sure that you're always ready against the scheme of Satan. Number two, don't flirt with temptation. That's why we did our series uh, Guardrails last month, right? Because when you flirt with temptation, when you are going close to the edge, right, it is very difficult for you to free yourself. So the, the right thing to do is just flee. Don't enter, entertain whatever thought that comes into your head. You know, oh, I'm just, just going to entertain this thought a little bit. No, don't do that. 
okay? Just don't argue with him. Don't have a conversation with him. Just flee. Don't flirt with temptation, and you will be grateful for it. Your family will be grateful for it. Your children, your grandchildren will be grateful for it. Let me tell you, just don't flirt, flee. Number three, know God's word well, so you won't be fooled. See, a lot of us, the reason why, I'm talking to the Christians right now. Many of you are deceived by Satan, and sometimes, let me tell you, he's very good at using the scriptures even to deceive you. Well, you are saved by grace. You can do whatever you want now, for example. Right? So, know God's word well so that you won't be fooled. And finally, number four, I want you to continue to focus on God's character and His goodness and His love towards you. There will be many things going on in your life that will try to sway you to the left or to the right. Let me tell you, just focus on God and His character. If you're not sure, you know, just trust in the God who loves you unconditionally, who will be there for you all the time, no matter what, and when you do that, everything suddenly will become clearer to you. You know, this would have been a really, really sad story had it just ended there. Adam and Eve realized they were naked, they were ashamed. In fact, they were hiding from God. But the grace is this, and this is the good news. God was the one who took the initiative to seek Adam and Eve. See? People who are against religion think that, okay, it's about our, our way to reach God. You know, every religion in the world, it's all the same. You know, like, do this, don't do that. You know, it's as if, like, we need to get ourselves right before God can accept us. But that's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is, while you were still in your sin, while Adam and Eve were still hiding, God was the one who sought them out. And God made a promise even though their mistake was fatal and final, and we are where we are today, this world is not the perfect world that God intended. This is a sinful world that we live in. And yet, right early on in the book of Genesis, God already prophesied, and He said this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike His heel. This ongoing battle between good and evil, eventually, you know, a few thousand years later, God was true to His Word like He always does. He sent His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, for you and for me, to restore again, to reverse the will in motion so that we could have the broken, we could have the relationship a beautiful relationship that God intended in the first place that was broken in the Garden of Eden. Listen to this very famous verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved this broken world, this sinful world, that is you, that is me, that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. The good news for you today, mothers, fathers, singles, God is for you. He did not come to this world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus Christ. So wherever you are, as I said early on, in your spiritual journey, open your heart. Open your heart to the possibility that the God of the universe, your creator, wants to have this deep and meaningful and personal relationship with you. And Jesus made that possible. No matter how bad you think you are, you're not that bad that you are beyond God's love, forgiveness, and redemption. Why don't you stand up on your feet? We're going to close in a word of prayer. If you have any specific prayer that you need us to pray for you for, please don't hesitate to come forward. Our prayer leaders will be up here in a few minutes. You can share your struggle. Maybe you need prayer for healing. Maybe you need some, you know, uh, other kind of prayers. Don't, you know, don't hesitate to come forward. We'd love to pray with you and for you. And don't go home right away. Every lady... Every woman in our midst will receive this coupon. Make sure you grab one uh, at, at the door and enjoy the free waffle courtesy of the Rocks and Pitcher and Iron. And uh, the rest of you, men, children, you can buy uh, one for $5. And um, yeah, that's it for me. Why don't we bow our head and receive God's blessing. Thank you, God, for what we heard today. Thank you for your reminder of the scheme of the evil one, to tempt us and to destroy us. And thank you for reminding us that you are a faithful God 
no matter what we've done in our lives. Thank you, God, that your love for us remains the same. Thank you that you love us unconditionally. You love us all the time, no matter what. But you love us too much to leave us the way we are. And I pray that as we are dismissed from this place, that your, your blessings will follow after us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you go. May God bless you through and through. May God bless your family. May God bless your work. May God bless your health. May God bless your relationships. May God bless everything that you do so that through you, people around you will be blessed. God's name will be glorified now and forevermore. All God's people who are blessed, say it together with me. Amen. 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 God bless you, everybody. Happy Mother's Day.